I'm with Dr. C. Rajamohan, Senior Fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute, uh, contributing editor to the Indian Express and one of India's top strategic thinkers, and Dr. Sanjay Baru, former editor of the Business Standard, um, distinguished fellow at the United Services Institute, which is an army think tank, also one of India's top strategic thinkers. And we are talking, of course, about Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to the US. This is the third state visit by an Indian Prime Minister since independence. The first, of course, was Jawaharlal Nehru, then Dr. Manmohan Singh uh, of the Congress Party, and now Prime Minister Narendra Modi of the BJP, a big event. And um, so let me welcome you guests, uh, to both of you to the print, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, let me start with you, Dr. Rajamohan. Prime Minister Modi has left for the US. He will be in New York for a day or so before his state visit to the US, which is uh, which begins in Washington, DC, where of course, he will meet uh, the American President Joe Biden, his team. But my first question to you is that just three days before uh, Prime Minister Modi meets Joe Biden, the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has met the Chinese President Xi Jinping. And from both sides, from both people, very warm words for the other country. Um, your, your first comments on that. Look, I mean, uh, I think uh, we have a tendency to take every time, you know, Chinese and the American leaders meet uh, as if it is a consequential uh, development. Uh, it is the first uh, visit by U.S. Secretary of State to Beijing in five years. These five years have seen rapid deterioration of U.S.-China relationship. And the visit was about starting a process uh, to stabilize the relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, that if you see what all has happened between the two in the last two years, it's a pretty significant negative dynamic. So they're trying to tamp it down. Uh, so I don't see how that affects uh, anything that we do with the United States. You don't see why it uh, affects, why it has anything to do with the United States? You don't think the India-U.S. relationship is in some way contextualized with China, the big dragon next door? No, that, that's fine. But the point is just one visit. If you think if visits, visits can resolve contradictions, uh, then everything would go. I think the, the fact is, I'm saying the US-China contradictions have deepened in the last five years. Mm -hmm. The visit is about managing those contradictions. Uh, there was nothing new uh, out there. It is really about starting a process of a dialogue. Even there, how to do the dialogue, there are deep differences. Uh, how to structure the agenda, there are deep differences. So, so I think it is a visit. So look, just we talk to the Chinese. Chinese sit on your territory, but you talk to them. We sit with them in Rick and Briggs. Or to think that, you know, Americans are talking to them as some kind of a, a sudden or a dangerous development. Uh, I don't buy that. All major countries, all major powers will engage each other. And I think that visit should be seen in that context. Are the Chinese sitting on your territory? Dr. Rajamohan? Well, I think you can go back to the 60s. I mean, uh, we say... Today, today, we're talking about today, the third anniversary. They're still sitting on it. They're still sitting on it. Uh, 38,000 square... You know, you, you covered them here, bit. You know, 38,000 square kilometers uh, of uh, Ladakh. And they claim 95,000 uh, square kilometers of Arunachal Pradesh. Okay. Okay, I'll, we'll come back to China. But uh, Dr. Baru, your first comments, the Prime Minister uh, has left for a state visit to the U.S., uh, he's he in an interview to the Wall Street Journal on the eve of uh, of his departure. He said, "We do not see India as supplanting any country. We see this process as India gaining its rightful position in the world." And then he said, "India is on its way to getting a much deserved higher, deeper, and wider profile and a role in global forums." You were media advisor to former Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh. Your first comments on uh, Prime Minister Modi's visit? Yeah. yeah, it's a it's an important visit. Uh, and the relationship has gone from strength to strength, uh, beginning in in my judgment with uh, you know the, uh, immediately after the nuclear test when Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee made that famous statement that India and the United States are natural allies, uh, and then culminating in the Indo U.S. nuclear deal, which in my judgment was the fundamental turning point uh, because it was recognizing India's status as a nuclear weapons power. Uh, and since then, you know, there have been incremental steps. Uh, I certainly see this as one more incremental step. I think cut out all the hype in the media, you know, what is called the Godi media in India. <laughs> Everybody's kind of singing Hosanas. And there are some defense deals. There are new, new areas of cooperation, as there should be a greater economic cooperation, greater technology cooperation, greater defense cooperation. 
But uh, each of these visits in the last, uh, what, 2006 to now, uh, almost 15, over 15 years, have been incremental. I think the fundamental shift came when President George Bush took the decision against a lot of resistance, even in the United States, uh, to do the deal with India. And Dr. Manmohan Singh, against a lot of resistance at home, did the deal. Uh, what will come out of this visit, I think, is a further strengthening of that bilateral relationship. Okay. Particularly in the defense field. So let me let me ask you the question I asked Dr. Rajmohan, which is the China question. In your view, the significance of the Antony Blinken visit to China, where he's shaking hands very warmly with Xi Jinping, obviously they, it's uh, uh, both sides have been very positive about it. And I will quote what Xi Jinping said, according to the Chinese spokesperson, of course. And he says that President Xi stressed that major country competition does not represent the trend of the time, still less can it solve America's own problems or challenges in the world. And then he goes on to say, which is interesting, China respects U.S. interests and does not seek to challenge or deplace the United States. But similarly, the other side should not deprive China of its legitimate right to development. Yes, I mean, I think it's true, as Raja said, that, you know, these meetings um, have not been happening. And, and the fact that there's a first visit of the Secretary of State to, to Beijing uh, is important. But I would draw attention to three things. You know, normally in bilateral relations, we look at what are called G2G, P2P and B2B, uh, government to government, business to business and people to people. And in all these three, there are significant statements. I think on the government to government, the reiteration of the one China policy uh, can particularly in the light of what has happened in the last year after the Nancy Pelosi visit, uh, reiteration of the one China policy by the United States, I think is an important message to China. Second, on the business to business, the statement by Secretary Blinken that American businessmen whom he met in Beijing uh, have said to him that they, will, they would like to grow their business. That's the phrase he used. They would like to grow their business with China. I think is an important statement considering the trade war and, and the kind of you know sentiment in the US about a geo-economic containment of China, reduced trade, reduced business. I think you know, the, the statement is significant. And thirdly, I think going back to increase people to people, I mean, the increase in uh, the reference to increased tourists, increased students, you know, China has always been the number one country in the US as far as students and tourists are concerned. And the U.S. has been number one country in China for tourists and students. So restoring a people to people, business to business, and a government to government equation, I think it's interesting. I mean, I, I don't think I would dismiss it away as saying that you know these things happen all the time, but it has happened now, and, and it has these dimensions. But Dr. Rajmohan, you're not uh, unduly worried about the uh, the U.S. China relationship and that it could become a G2 or a compact between the US and China. But my, my, the, the point that I'm trying to drive home is, does India get marginalized or in, should India be concerned about a coming together between the US and China? Look, I mean, I find a strange logic in Delhi that uh, when the Russian and the Chinese leaders meet, proclaim an alliance without limits, say they have common interests in Eurasia, uh, announce a set of values and say they're going to stand together, uh, we say, no, 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 don't worry about US, Russia, China. No, they're, they're okay. They, there'll be always be differences. But the moment anything happens between US and China, we say, my God, G2 is going to happen. So, so I think, look, we're now as a major power in our own right. I think we should be relaxed about this. Uh, this idea that nothing will happen between the other, other powers, uh, I think is, uh, is, is, uh, is really an illusion. I mean, I think we should be prepared for consistent shifts in the relationship between the major powers. Uh, Sanjay and I, we've seen in our lifetime, US and Russia, US and China were enemies in the 50s and 60s. They were friends in the 80s and 90s. They're problems today. Russia and China were big buddies. They were communist countries. They fought in the 60s and the 70s. They came together in the 80s. So, so I think that ships uh, should, are, are natural. I think what has changed in the last 70 years is India's position has improved in the hierarchy of the international system. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I don't see we're going to be marginalized. I think our leverages have improved all around our own partnership. So I would say let's focus on what we do with the Americans, what we do with the Russians, rather than saying the other two guys are meeting, therefore we're going to be marginalized. And I, I think uh, that is really, uh, I don't see that happening. 
In fact, uh, all indicators are that our position has improved uh, I mean, purely from basic numbers. Okay, so the uh, the question to you, Dr. Rajabohan, is that you talked about the shift in the international system. In a piece that you wrote for the Indian Express a few weeks ago, which got a lot of response, in which you talked about the world moving towards a bipolar um, sort of a state. And from what I understood from your piece, you were sort of encouraging India and Prime Minister Modi to move towards the US. Am I right about that? And if And if yes, how do you explain what you said? You're right about the first part and wrong about the second part. Okay. Uh, so I'm saying, look, China and the US today are way ahead of all the other powers. Okay. So everybody else, you can call the middle powers or whatever you want. But US and China, in terms of the GDP, uh, in terms of the military capabilities, they are far, far ahead uh, about the rest of the pack. So, so, I mean, people have argued on this. There are a lot of differences of how you frame the multipolarity, unipolarity, bipolarity but the fact is these two are way ahead of the others mm -hmm. and what i'm saying is that look, we have our principal contradiction today is with china uh, whether it's a boundary issue a question of uh, geopolitics of the subcontinent of the indian ocean uh, so our strategy would be how do you balance china and within that i said us plays a role japan plays a role europe plays a role that's what we're doing okay. so so if you start from your question of your interests, uh, that our engagement with the U.S. has grown uh, because uh, uh, partly because of the China question. So, so there's no denying that. That doesn't mean uh, we become a camp follower for the United States or we become you know somebody else's uh, junior partner. Because again, look, I think we have a small state syndrome. That, so why that, should you become a camp follower of any country? That's what you said in your tweet. So that's why I'm responding to that. I'm not saying it. I'm saying as a country of $3.5 trillion, why are you imagining yourself as a camp follower all the time? So I think that is part of the problem. And the second problem I see that when we sign something with the Russians, we're not camp followers of the Russians, right? We had a 71 treaty. We have allowed a 60% of our weapons dependence on Russia. There is a, oh, that's fine. But the moment you do anything with the US, you say, oh my God, there is a problem. So I think we have grown up with these uh, uh, ideological uh, you know, presumptions, but I would say, uh, India's bargaining power has increased uh, overall. And as our government has repeatedly said, uh, it wants to expand its cooperation with the US. It wants to retain the friendship with, with Russia, uh, engage Europe, strengthen ties with Japan. That's what do you agree with that? Do you think that India should become much closer to the US, start buying more defense equipment, reduce its dependence on Russia, especially on the defense front? It's already doing that, isn't it? Now, the question is to you. I said it is already doing that, right? That is empirically. Okay. Starting from 1990, you started diversification from Russia. You think India should do much more, buy much more from the Americans in terms of I think that is the main outcome of this visit. Uh, Prime Minister Modi's visit is about the US extending support for uh, a, India's defense industrial modernization. That is the principal objective. So it is not what I say that matters, what the government of India is doing, that's what matters. Dr. Baru, um, I want to ask you the same question, which is that, do you believe that India should become much closer to the US or do you think that should retain its sort of strategic autonomy, for want of a better phrase? India will always retain its strategic autonomy. Getting close to the United States is not about giving up your strategic autonomy, but acquiring that autonomy in ability to deal with other countries. That was the basis of our understanding even when we did the nu nuclear deal with the United States, that this was not about increasing our dependence on the U.S., but using that as a way in which we acquire greater freedom to function as a nation globally. And I think the fact is that we have always been an independent nation in our thinking. Uh, from time to time, we depend on others for help. When we are in difficulties, in 1962, when the Chinese invaded India, we went to the American for support. In 1971, when China and the United States ganged up, we went to the Russians for support. So, you know, using other countries in order to extend our own uh, you know, uh, ability to deal with the world doesn't mean you're giving up your strategic autonomy. You keep changing friends. As Raja said, I mean, Russia and China were friends, then they became enemies. US and China were friends, then they're having problems. These relationships change. I think there's this famous quote that you know there are no permanent friends and permanent enemies. Okay. There are permanent interests. Okay. And India's permanent interest 
is to be one of the major powers in the world. We are a civilizational nation. You know, the, the, every prime minister from Nehru have said that. In fact, I think the BJP fellows go on saying that this is Narendra Modi's formulation. It is not. You go back to speeches of Nehru, of Indira Gandhi, of um, Narsimha Rao, Adil Bihari Vajpayee and Manmohan Singh. Okay. And I can tell you Manmohan Singh, several of his speeches. We claim we are a civilizational nation. What does that mean? That we represent some values, some ideas, so, some, some principles globally, right? Just as China is, just as the United States is or Europe is. So, therefore, this question of strategic autonomy it does, isn't about dependencies. Dependencies are always there. Mm -hmm. Today, the European Union has become dependent on, on the United States. That okay. doesn't mean the European Union does not have an independent view of some of its relationships, right? So, as far as that question is concerned, I think, you know, the, the world recognizes. I think the reason this question has suddenly come up in the last one year is that many in the West began to assume that somehow we are part of the American or Western camp and then the Russians invaded Ukraine, that we'd automatically endorse the Western perception of that. And suddenly when they found that India was no longer on, this, uh, on, on the same page, uh, there was utter confusion until you know, yeah. Jashankar had to make that famous speech yeah. that Europe's problems are not a, in uh, the world's problems. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Sorry to in interrupt, but the question, you know, my what I'm trying to ask you, Dr. Rajamohan, and earlier you, Dr. Baru, is that this whole thing about India's strategic autonomy? You hear a lot, and some of it has been written by you, Dr. Rajamohan, about how India must get closer to the U.S. and and. The impression that I have is that, that you do not believe that India should walk that middle path anymore. Am I correct? Okay. Uh, look, I think as, how does large countries don't become junior partners for anyone? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and India's relative weight has grown. I mean, when you are nobody, when your per capita income was below $200, you could navigate between the powers. Why would you think in India, whose GDP at $3.5 trillion would uh, become suddenly, you know, a little baby in the woods. I mean, it is not going to be a baby in the woods. I think it's overall leverages have grown. So, so I think the framing of this question that moment you do anything with the US, my, oh my God, India's strategic autonomy is under threat. And I think that's a formulation that is a fundamentally problem. It doesn't start with... But do you believe that India should get close to the, to the US? And do you believe that Prime Minister Modi... Yes, did it? For 20 it, years, for is 20, the, is 20 it years we yeah. have gotten closer to the United States. Okay. So that is a reality. Today, the India's trade with the US this year is $190 billion. $191. Yeah, $191 billion. I mean, there was a time when Mr. Blackpill, uh, ambassador here in 2001, two, used to say trade was flat as a chapati uh, at less than $20 billion. Uh, your diaspora there has increased. Your technological linkages have increased. Do you believe, Dr. Rajabohan, that this visit by the Prime Minister is constitutes a shift in India's foreign policy and that India is getting much more closer to the US and abandoning its middle path, which is a phrase I love. I think you're wrong on all counts. Uh, India's Thank you. I'm so glad that I'm allowing you to explain yourself. I don't think anybody's given you this opportunity in a while. <laughs> so India's relationship with the US is shifting. It is moving from on the defense side, from buyer-seller relationship to co-production. If the GE uh, uh, General Electric, uh, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited deal on engine manufacture comes. That's an important step forward. Uh, if we agree on U.S. investments in India's semiconductor manufacturing, that's a big step forward. Then India becomes part of the global uh, semiconductor supply chain. So these are new things that are that are likely to happen uh, in the visit. So the nature of our relationship with the United States is becoming thicker, more more diverse, which is what the Prime Minister said in his interview to the Wall Street Journal. Right. That doesn't mean you give up on your other relationships. Which other relationship? Like Russia with Europe, with Japan, uh, with uh, uh, other members of the Quad. Those are those are existing relationships. But you also have a problem with China, which is also reality. So these are the realities you're trying to manage from a position where you are stronger than ever before. Dr. Baru, in your view, the, um, India's relationship with Russia it's has diminished considerably. It's become basically about one or two issues, primarily about defense and now oil. Over the last one year since the invasion of Ukraine, India's purchase of Russian oil is perhaps uh, amongst its uh, uh, top foreign policy. Um, it constitutes one of the largest sort of imports that, it, uh, that it's made. 
Do you think that, again, there can be a zero-sum game between India, Russia, and the U.S. because the U.S. and Russia have such a terrible relationship? Or do you think that India can manage all these uh, relationships that it has, the powers that it has ties with? India has managed and India will continue to manage. So there's no question of a zero-sum game. We have uh, uh, strong relations with Russia. Uh, very critical dependencies in the defense field, in the strategic field. These are important dependencies. They are not going to go away overnight. In fact, I think today in Washington Post, there was an article looking, for example, at the BrahMos uh, missile relationship, which is a very, very significant relationship with Russia, which will be there for a long time. And if you talk to people from the Indian Armed Forces, they will tell you that a lot of the pipeline stuff uh, will be significant and important for the next 20 years. But I think the point about defense is very different. Point is, one, we are diversifying. 20 years ago, Russia's share of India's defense imports was almost 80%, if my memory mm -hmm. serves me right. Right. Uh, today, today, it's around 40%. It's half. Mm -hmm. America's share, when you know the famous meeting between Donald Rumsfeld and Pranam Mukherjee happened in 2004, if I'm not mistaken, or early 2005, before Manmohan Singh went to the US, uh, was hardly a single digits. I, again, uh, maybe 3-4%. Mm -hmm. um, and today, uh, America's share is about 26%, uh, which is still less than Russia's share. Mm -hmm. But there are other countries, France, for example, or Israel. I think there are two aspects to India's uh, defense modernization. Okay. And, and we should not forget that there are two aspects. One is to diversify Mm -hmm. And in the diversification that only helps the India, it doesn't weaken India, is for being dependent on one country or now you know diversifying your sources across many countries. Okay. But more, more importantly, the present government, the Narendra Modi government, has enunciated a policy called Atma Nirbharata in defense. Right. Which is to encourage indigenization of defense manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And even the GE program, uh, the, the deal which is being struck, let us see what comes out of the wash, uh, is about domestic production. That's what it is. It's co-production and, uh, and co-manufacturing. Yeah. And, and we have to look at how much technology will be brought, what technology will be transferred, what generation technology, etc. Those are all the details we'll have to look at. Yes. But co-production, localization of manufacturing is this government's policy, which I think is correct. I mm -hmm. mean, I have been arguing this for the last 10 years. Okay. If you look at the industrial strategies of most developed countries, most developed countries, from United States to France to Germany to Japan, defense manufacturing has been an extremely important element of industrial development policy. But in, that, in that case, in that case, Dr. Rajamohan, we are talking about co-manufacturing or co-development co of the GE uh, fighter engine uh, in India. Uh, that would you agree that that is a game changer? But my question is about Defense Minister Rajnath Singh asking his American counterpart Lloyd Austin when he was here a few weeks ago, saying that we hope that the Americans will also transfer technology. To which Lloyd Austin hummed and hawed. What do you think? Look, uh, I think uh, first let me back what Sanjay was saying on you know it is the big change. Uh, of policy has been encouraging Indian capital and foreign capital to come and produce in India, mm -hmm. as opposed to merely buying up from outside. We are saying we want them to come and invest in India, produce in India. Okay. Uh, and uh, strengthening India's private sector's participation in defense production. That has been a big, big new development. So well before uh, we have the G. Hal deal that is likely to be there tomorrow, uh, what we've seen is the Tata Airbus deal to produce the C-295 military transport aircraft that was announced last year. Uh, this is the first of its kind where an Indian private sector company is manufacturing a major weapon system in partnership with outsiders. Otherwise, uh, it was a monopoly of the Indian public sector undertaken. So that's a big change. Okay. So I think you're going to see with the transfer of technology that it's already the last two days we're being reported. Uh, speculation about 80% of the technology will be transferred. Not 100%. Let's talk about 80%. And that within that 80%, it is not just uh, uh, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited or the G glass turbine research establishment. 
The idea, I believe, uh, is to have Tata's and other private sector companies participate in the engine development. Uh, developing an engine is a huge enterprise. Uh, there is also reports which saying nearly 300 medium and small enterprises will also be part of uh, participating uh, in this manufacture of the engine. So you're going to, the idea is this would be a trigger for production uh, of uh, the entire aerospace ecosystem uh, in Bangalore and Hyderabad. That is the big change if this deal uh, comes through uh, in the next two days. Which, which it is likely to come through. And that is quite incredible because it basically gives jobs. It gives employments to uh, thousands of people, which, which of course is something that we all um, are in favor of. But my question is, uh, Dr. Rajamon, why are the Americans so hesitant about transferring 100% technology, like the Russians do in some cases? Look, uh, we've been manufacturing, uh, you know, Russian aircraft uh, for 60 years. Have the Russians given you full technology transfer? They've not. So nobody, see, look. They haven't, the Russians this, haven't given you full technology transfer? Nobody, yeah, nobody has given, nobody has given you full technology transfer. The point is, look, in the US. I think on the, on the uh, nuclear submarine, there was not just technology transfer, but I think the engine that powers uh, the, India's nuclear submarine is a Russian one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the Russians are helping build us. So look, it's again a, a joint effort. Look. This notion that outsiders will come hand over technology on a plate uh, to the Indian companies is a fundamental mistake. Uh, unlike in Russian case or the Chinese case, here the intellectual property is owned by a company. It's not owned by the US government. So technology will get transferred in a business to business deal in a co-production where both sides benefit. That's how it's going to happen and not by handing over the whole technology to an Indian public sector company, please sir, here is my technology, take it. I think that's the way we frame this issue. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, Tata's have been producing uh, components for the C-130 aircraft. You have uh, Tata's producing for the Sikorsky uh, you know, helicopters. But, but the so, question is, no, the question is that, yes, this is between private companies and, and perhaps GE doesn't want to transfer all 100% of its technology. But the question is that India is getting the technology. Hindustan Aeronautics is a government of India uh, public un sector undertaking. In the Russian case, for example, in the nuclear submarine case, the Russians have are helping you build that engine. They are transferring technology. So why is it that the U.S. government doesn't tell GE, "Ki boss, transfer kar DJ technology, Bharat ko"? I think you fundamentally, you know, got it completely wrong. The idea you convinced Russians have already transferred you technology. You are not producing a single engine, aero engine, in India. Years of investment, both in the domestic. So you're saying that the Russians are not. So let's get that clear. So why are you so shocked? I mean, I mean, you convinced. I'm, I'm like asking. No, no, I'm asking you. I'm asking. No, 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 Dr. 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 I'm asking you. Are the Russians transferring technology no, or not? No, you're not able to produce those engines. You're not producing a single major aero engine. The only components you're producing today, again, it is a Tata GE deal, wherein the civil aircraft engines are be producing in the Leap engine. Uh, Tata's produced some uh, components for it. So, so look. You know, you don't go by a priori assumptions that the engine technology transfer is a big change in the way U.S. deals with India. That is a change. And within that, 80 percent, I think, is a good number to start with. Uh, don't, don't start saying, look, give me everything and then we'll talk. I mean, it doesn't, no business happens like that. Dr. Baru, uh, Dr. Rajmohan says that the Russians have not transferred any technology to India. Uh, do you agree with that? You work for a, a defense think tank. Do you, do you know how much uh, time it took for Maruti, for Suzuki to transfer gear technology when they had the Maruti Suzuki? Mm -hmm. I mean, which country, which company transfers technology? Uh, that's that's your intellectual property, right? And, and, and so, I mean, it's not a big issue. You know, the, the point is like the Chinese who copied technology and had the intellectual equipment to copy technology and indigenize it, we should develop the same thing. Unfortunately, we do, our ability to copy is not as good as the Chinese ability to copy. The, the problem in China was that a lot of the, you know, they knock down the stuff and find out how it works and, and, and uh, put it back together. You know, in 2001, I think, or 2002, when the, the Chinese shot down an American plane uh, on Hainan Island, the first thing they did was to completely unwrap that plane 
and figure out you know how it is built and then gave the individual parts back to the americans you know in a box you know, so that is the way you get technology you have to steal it nobody gives you technology yeah? so you agree with dr rajabohan that the russians have not transferred any technology i don't know i said look i don't know what the russians have given i'm not given. i'm not an expert on russian investments in indian defense but i'm making a general point that nobody gives you technology unless either it is dated that they don't need it i'm sure you know there will be a lot of transfer of technology in many of these deals but not the latest technology you know what america will keep the latest technology after all it's it has developed that intellectual property mm-hmm. uh, it may sell it to, uh, to you at a price and technologies are sold at a price but you know it's one thing the japanese dragged their feet for almost what for 15 years before they told you how to you know the, the, uh, get technology in a car and you're talking about defense technology is far more strategic you know so i don't think okay. this is so really the, issue. the question is do we have the intellectual capacity in this country and the will power to actually copy that technology and talk a snook at the other country that is where china has scored uh, or you know and that is the major complaint of of the west against china that you fellows cheat you fellows copy oh, that's what that's part of the game but dr uh, dr raja mohan if india gets even closer to the us do you think it might be helpful for the us to transfer technology to india like it does with its allies uh, japan australia uh, new zealand look i think we are not in the same league look i think again you know depending on how this venture goes it's it's a, it look as i said look you have the airbus doing something so this see. is a litmus test in a sense look it's just the beginning of a process if this succeeds i'm sure the other companies will invest you have today large companies in india like the tatas the lnt uh, you have mahindras you have uh, baba kalyani who are beginning to do defense production uh, we've seen uh, there was a k9 the, the korean uh, artillery stuff was produced in india uh, lnt is producing weapons in india so i think the indian defense production by the private companies is expanding this opens up room for greater collaboration with the foreign capital and i think we're seeing the engine of course is the at the top end of it but a lot of other stuff will also begin to happen okay so uh, let me ask you ashley tellis uh, who is one of um, uh, america's top noted thinkers especially on the india question wrote a piece a few weeks ago called america's bad bet on india in which he says that the americans should not depend on india uh, divorcing itself from the russians and coming closer to the us would you agree with that I don't know I saw you interview Ashley I don't know what he said uh, so I'm the, glad you I'm glad you're watching my I've seen that. my interviews I think you, you talk to Ashley look uh, Ashley you know is a very informed person he's taken a position that uh, India would not join US in a fight against China India has its own problems with China so it's not going to join a US fight with China that's a contingency on which it might happen and people have asked the US officials they say look we are trying to develop a, a relationship with India and how that evolves depends on the circumstances so nothing is set in stone at this point so the question to both of you and let me ask you Dr Baru is that if on the one hand the uh, american uh, sort of building up of the quad is in within quotes a containment of china um on the other hand you have blinken go to to the to china shake hands with xi jinping can you marry the two yeah of course you can marry the two that's the whole point about that's the way i look at the us china relationship uh they are managing a transition a global transition uh and, and of course uh, the secretary blinken has explicitly said yesterday in beijing if you heard that 52 minute press conference that we are not in the business of containing china he said this is not the economic containment of china right so america doesn't claim it is containing china it is building relationships in in the region fine and 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 why not uh, the point is china has now a certain global position is a 17 18 trillion dollar economy it, most importantly it has developed domestic capabilities Now, i think in india we don't pay enough attention to domestic capabilities mm-hmm. look at r and d look at manufacturing you know look at science and technology <clears throat> domestic capacities are extremely important 
it is not about what others give you that determines mm -hmm. where you are in the world. It is what you can do on your own that determines where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. I think the reason why the West looks at China today with greater you know, worry or whatever is because China has acquired that domestic capability. And I believe that is the objective of Atma Nirvar. Right. Is something I completely endorse. We need to also build our domestic capability. Nobody is going to make you a big power. Absolutely. Unless we work on our own, which means investment in education, investment in infrastructure, investment in science and research, in human capital. These are the investments we should make. Right. And China is making them. And China has emerged as the second most powerful country in the Economy world. in the world, yeah. And America has to deal with that reality, right? So I think, you know, Quad and all these are relationships. There are many such relationships. I have recently written a, a column suggesting that US, India, and China should have a trilateral. I don't see any reason why not. Okay. Uh, because, because in many ways, we, we, we can sort out a lot of our misunderstandings at a bilateral level in a trilateral uh, relationship. I, I'm not sure that Dr. Rajamohan is going to agree with you on that, Dr. Baru. So let me ask you, Dr. Rajamohan, you've written a lot about the US containment of China. Uh, I read you very carefully, by the way. Uh, so, what do you think now? But Anthony Blinken now says that the U.S. is not containing China. I know. I don't remember ever saying that the U.S. Has, can, wants to contain China. Okay, I'm going to send you, uh, yeah, you know, please. phrase and paragraph after this interview. <laughs> China is too big to be contained. You know, let's be let's go with the facts rather than you know right. that. Unlike Soviet Union, which opted out of the global economic system or kept out of the global economic system. China is a capitalist economy. It's the second largest economy, deeply integrated, the, the biggest trading partner to most of the uh, world, uh, from Latin America to the Pacific Islands. Uh, so the idea that, that they can be contained, uh, I don't think anyone uh, serious uh, says it. What people have talked about is balance, a regional stability. Those are the kind of issues. So, so that is what is being... What does talked. that mean? What does balance and regional stability balance mean? Vis-a-vis -vis vis -vis vis -vis India. Vis -vis India that India and others in the region have capabilities to deter China from doing certain kinds of things like grabbing territory unilaterally. Uh, producing that kind of deterrence is a challenge. So not a question of containing China by any, because I said you don't have the capacity, nobody has the capacity to contain China. So how does the US help India do that? If India, you said earlier that the Chinese have taken Indian territory, that they're sitting on Indian territory, so if India and the U.S. are coming closer together, do you think the Americans can help you deter China? Again, you know, you're conflating so many things. Look, we've That's had this territorial problem. problem with China from the time of independence. Uh, we've never been able to settle that boundary dispute. Uh, in the last uh, two major crises, uh, we told the Americans, look, we don't want you to come in. We're not asking for the American soldiers to come in. Uh, we're not asking them to fight here, just as they don't expect you to uh, fight uh, in their battles, that a U.S. that supports India's military modernization, a U.S. that supports India's broader capabilities would help India develop deterrence and balance. That's what is being talked about. Uh, this is not something they're going to save us. Look, you are a large country. In the end, we have to take care of our own security. The no, no, we're not, we're not talking about the Americans. Yeah, sorry. I know I'm just saying that obviously nobody wants the Americans to save you. Uh, you're far too big to be saved, just like the Chinese are far too big to be contained, um, but but yes, go ahead. No, no. So, so I I think it's a question of building partnerships. Uh, that that uh, as as we said earlier, we turned to the Soviet Union to balance China. Uh, after all, Soviet Union and China were fighting with each other in the sixties. That's one reason why Russia turned to India. So today there is a rejigging of that that balance, and that is what is unfolding. As I said, compared to the sixties, seventies, and eighties, uh, India is in a better position, a better capabilities. So are you turning to the U.S. today to balance China? U.S., Japan, Europe, everyone to create domestic capabilities. To balance China? Is that one of one of the um, goals? Yes. Uh, creating a stable system of balance of power in Asia is the principal objective. So, you know, you guys are strategic thinkers, but um, lay people like me don't understand this very, very well. So I'm going to ask you both to explain. On the one hand, you see the Americans reaching out to the Chinese. And on the other hand, you're saying that India is reaching out to the U.S. to balance China. Uh, Dr. Rajamohan? U.S. has been reaching out to China from 1971 when Henry Kissinger went there. 
The okay. train is, you know, is massive. Uh, the number of flights, the number of students. Uh, that has grown dramatically in the last 40 years. What we've seen in the last five years is a is an emergence of contradictions between them, and they're trying to manage it uh, at this point. Uh, that's what is happening at this point. I, I don't see suddenly they're going there. They've been there. In fact, our problem with the U.S.-China uh, collaboration, that's the reason why India signed a security treaty with the Soviet Union in 71. Since then, their commercial relationship has grown. Uh, their engagement has grown. But in the last five years, there are problems between them that have emerged. So just because the nature of that relationship, US wants a stable balance of power in Asia. They're willing to uh, support India's uh, growth. That's what is happening. That doesn't mean they're going to cut off the relationship with China. Or are you going to cut off your relationship with Russia? Or are you going to give up engaging China? Dr. Baru, you have the last word. It's not a game, as I have uh, consistently held the view that the world is moving in the direction of greater multipolarity uh, in which different countries seek to uh, increase their individual uh, you know, um, strategic autonomy or power, if you like. And in this game, relationships are going to be in constant flux. It is not a static game. In it constant is, flux, right? In constant flux. It is not a static game. It's a dynamic game. You look at even Europe, um, you know, one step forward, one step backward with China, with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, India on many issues. Uh, every country is trying to see how it can position itself in a world that is changing. We are moving away from the brief 300 years of, you know, global dominance of one or two powers. Okay. Go back in history, before the British Empire emerged, for a thousand years, there was no single power in the world. There was a Chinese empire, there was an Indian, a Mughal empire, there were European empires, right. you know, multiple empires. Mm -hmm. and, and, and multipolarity was the structure of the global system till European colonialism uh, you know, acquired dominance. But today, do you believe that it's a multipolar world? No, don't interrupt me. The whole history of the last 75 years of decolonization has been to reduce the power of these earlier uh, imperial centers and to create greater autonomy for newly emerging nations like India, like China, like South Africa, like Brazil. That is the game we are in. And that is why I believe that is the direction in which we will evolve. The United States is becoming less and less powerful. It is no longer in a position to dictate to anybody. Just as you know, uh, the European Union has become virtually uh, powerless, it, it, we can see that, you know, in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it is turned to America for help. So we are in a world of changing power balances. And, and therefore, the question of, you know, why are you here with this guy today and with another guy tomorrow? This will happen. This will continue to happen. In fact, as the world becomes more multipolar, there will be more such switches happening all the time as nations seek to defend their national interests. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the objective of foreign policy for the Indian government is to take care of its national interests. In the right. service of its national interests, it may one day go with the Americans, another day with the Russians, a third day even with the Chinese. Depends on what those interests are. Absolutely. Well, we'll have to leave it there, but we will watch Prime Minister Modi's visit to the US over the next few days uh, unfold very, very closely. Uh, but I'd like to thank you both, Dr. Raja Mohan, uh, Dr. Sanjay Baru. Thank you both so much for your time, for joining me on the print debates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.